Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Realtree, Hoyt Archery, Muddy Outdoors, Fuse Accessories, Trophy Rock, Frigid Forage, Scott Archery, Cabela's, Rocket Broadheads, Woods Zero Turn Mowers, Bloodsport Arrows, Redneck Hunting Blinds, Scentmaster, Yeti Coolers, Scentlock, and Nikon. Welcome to Midwest Whitetail. I've got quite a selection of subjects that I'm going to cover in today's episode. We're going to talk about this mower real quick. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, a couple of, of uh, small food plots that I'm creating on the farm. They're going to be great stand locations for this fall. Explaining a little bit more about that subject. We touched on it earlier during the off-season series where we dove into the whole matter of, of creating these small staging areas. Uh, we're going to dive further into that today. Uh, we've got uh, establishing a clover plot and some of the steps that, that we used to create a uh, clover plot here on the farm last week. And then uh, also we're gonna talk about uh, mushroom hunting. So let's talk about this mower for just a second. This is my new pride and joy. Uh, I love this thing. I mean, you can see what kind of a smooth job that it does on our yard. This is wet grass. It, it rained pretty much all last night. And we haven't had a lot of chance for it to dry out very well. And it, it handles wet grass with ease. So you can imagine how well it does on dry grass. We've got a big yard. Normally it takes about anywhere between five and six hours to mow our lawn using a traditional 54 inch deck like a craftsman riding mower. But this woods mowing machine can knock this yard out in about less than half that time. If I really get after it in just a couple of hours, you know, two and a half hours at the most, I can knock out the whole yard. You're looking at just the front yard. There's a whole big backyard in behind the house. So there's a lot of mowing here, but the woods product is ideally suited to somebody who either has a large estate, a large yard like we have, or they just want to get what they've got done quickly. Uh, again, that's our situation here, but also on the industrial side. You know, these are really industrial grade mowers. They do a great job. Like I said, I mean, you can look at our yard and you can see what I mowed yesterday compared to what it looks like now. And this is what that looked like yesterday. So anyway, uh, enough on the woods mower. They're a new sponsor at Midwest Whitetail. I really want to give them you know, some opportunity for everybody to be aware of the great products that they produce. Now we're gonna go from here and we're gonna to jump to uh, a couple of small food plots that I'm gonna talk about. Little areas that uh, managed correctly and set up right are gonna produce some great bow hunting this fall. I'm checking out this small opening behind me and it's gonna be this year's version of the poor man plot. And we've done one each of the last two springs now where we've taken a small clearing or an area that uh, basically needs, let's say, some additional cleanup and turning it into a food plot using uh, no power tools. And it's uh, quite a process. It's something that everybody can do. And this spot really is a good example of the types of locations that you can look for in your hunting area to create one of these plots. And we're gonna show you over the next uh, couple of weeks exactly how you create the poor man plot. Uh, even hunters uh, hunting on permission find this to be a, a, a definitely uh, an inexpensive and very effective way to improve the hunting in their area. So what makes this spot good, first off is the location. Uh, it's up on a ridge, so it's gonna have some decent soil to it. You know, you get too far off over an edge, you sometimes get into some pretty heavy clay around here. So this one's gonna have some topsoil, so we know what, whatever we plant in there is gonna grow. It's about the right size. This one's probably an eighth of an acre, I would say. At the very most, it's a quarter of an acre. I like the fact that it's isolated. Uh, there's a road, oh, a few hundred yards, a couple hundred yards in front of me. And these trees uh, basically block it. And there's cedar trees almost all the way around this little clearing. And off the backside, there's a pretty nice little valley where the deer could come up out of. And I know they cross the road roughly in this area quite a bit. So what we're doing is we're creating that classic staging area. The deer come up out of that valley hit this little spot first, and then they move off across as evening uh, comes in and, and move into some uh, larger areas to feed. So that's the magic formula. That's what we're looking for. Uh, I think there's gonna be one tree that we've gotta take out. There's a big cedar tree over my left shoulder back here. I think he's gotta go. Otherwise, there's just mostly brush back in there. 
And some of that we can take out with the chainsaw and some of it we'll just uh, spray with the Roundup and let it die and then we'll burn it out with fire. You can see when we get back in here that it opens up pretty good. I'm gonna walk around the edge. A number of little small cedar trees in here that we're gonna have to take out. I mentioned this one, uh, some of this brush here. It's actually multifloral rose. It'll go, some of the little brushy trees along the edge will go. I'm not gonna go over the edge, over the side of the, the ridge top with my, with my food plot. I'm gonna stay up on top. But I'm gonna go down here and see what it looks like. It looks like it kind of tapers down and we might have a little bit more here to work with than what I first thought. You can see down here it kind of, the whole food plot sort of comes down to a little narrow pinch. But there's more here on top than what I thought. I'm gonna go down a little bit further and look at it, but you can see some nice oak trees on both sides and make great tree stand locations. I mean, even that one right there, you've got a west wind. There's a valley that drops off sharply there. Your scent would blow out over that valley. You'd have a shot at everything that comes out in here. I mean, this would be a good little killing spot. We'll keep looking at it. I can come clear down to here with it, another 35 yards further than what I thought when I first looked at the plot. Uh, you know, it'd be a great spot to not be a poor man plot, because I can see coming in here with that Cabela's brush mower and cleaning this thing up in about 15 minutes, instead of six hours with a chainsaw, cleaning up all this stuff along the edge here, but I guess that's why it's a poor man plot. Um, at some point, we're gonna stop doing this poor man series and give my old body a break. This is the second spot I'm gonna talk about this morning. This one's not gonna be a poor man plot. We're gonna use the Cabela's equipment and we're gonna come in here and uh, spray it, kill it, wait about 10 days or two weeks, uh, come back in with the tiller, uh, till it up, and then there's a, they make a cedar that does a real nice job with planting clover, which is what we'll put in this plot. The reason I like this one is because it's at the back end of this big field. And the field is probably, I don't know, 10 acres or so, seven acres. And then you've got this little half acre, small opening surrounded by heavy cover all the way around it, tucked back in here. And it's too small of a spot for the farmer to feel like he's gonna get anything out of it. So he doesn't farm it. So that makes the perfect spot for a staging area for the deer to hit, uh, spend a little bit of time in and then work their way out uh, into the larger ag field. Again, these are the kinds of spots that you can probably find in a lot of places. A lot of areas where you hunt are going to have these little corners at the back ends of these ridgetop fields where the farmer just doesn't want to mess with them. Sometimes they've started to grow back in again. You know, if we let this one go for a few more years, there'd be some trees popping up in here. And 20 years from now, there'd be trees, you know, scattered throughout this whole little, this little small area. So you might have to go in and clear it out. So take a look for those. Uh, this one in particular, is a little bit challenging and we've talked about it before on the episodes. This is where I shot Curly last year. It's a hard spot to hunt because it's surrounded on all sides by bedding except for the open field. So trying to find a wind direction where it's not either blowing into a bedding area or blowing out into the, you know, where the deer are starting to come out into to feed, that's the challenge here. And of course getting out of it at the end of legal shooting time is never easy either. And that's always the case, you know, anytime you're hunting a feeding area type of a stand. There's a couple things I'm gonna do probably here. Uh, I'm probably going to plant something across the front of this and leave just a little small opening to get the equipment in and something to kind of uh, concentrate the deer that are leaving the staging area and going out into the field. You can't really see it from any roads, but I do think that by closing off the end just a little bit, we'd make this feel more secure to the deer so they'd come out here a little bit earlier in the evenings. Uh, either way though, even if I don't close it off, this is going to be one of those spots where the deer are going to hit it you know, well before the end of legal shooting time. whereas a stand further out in the bigger field, you might not have that, that same opportunity because they might wait, which they often do, before they come out into the big fields uh, in the evenings to feed. The stand is up in that tree right there, and that tree died a couple of years ago, and it's not the perfect spot anyway because it sits right on top of the deer. So whenever they come out, it just seems like they're, they're on to you right away. I mean, Curly was on to me right away. Uh, last October when I killed him, I got lucky on that one to get away with it, but over my right shoulder, and behind me is a better oak tree. It's back in behind these cedar trees. And it's the kind of spot I think where you're off just enough from the field edge that the deer aren't gonna be spotting you up in that tree. They're gonna come out here and do their thing and they're gonna come by and offer you a nice uh, uh, relaxed and, and natural shot. 
whereas that tree right there is just a little bit too close to the action. Something to keep in mind, you always want to sit right on top of the deer and a lot of times that doesn't work. A lot of times it's better to set up where they come to you. You know, not where they come out of the timber, but in these small plots especially, you let them come out and work their way to you. That way you've, you can set up easier on the wind and you've got a little bit better chance of uh, being undetected when they're coming out into the food plot. I'm standing on the edge of a food plot that I planted a week ago, actually a week ago yesterday, and I talked about it in some detail about how to establish a clover plot. This one's planted to the Frigid Forage Pure Trophy Clover Blend. So I'm going to go ahead and take you to that interview. And this was actually pulled uh, from a series that we're now producing for Frigid Forage called the Food Plot Season. So every couple of weeks uh, for the spring and into the summer, we're going to be producing these episodes for the Frigid Forage uh, website called the Food Plot Season. We talk about a lot of stuff on the series. You know, in this case, uh, the clover is what we'd call a spring planted perennial. We talk about annuals, different types of food plots that you might plant in different situations and why. Uh, we'll get into plot screen and how to utilize that to make it easier to get to and from your tree stands. Uh, let's see, we also covered some of the other subjects that are a little bit more, I'd say, uh, advanced or on the fringe. Uh, stuff like planting plow down clover, you know, where you can plow down something that you plant in the spring or that you, that you frost seed during the winter and use that as green manure or a source of nitrogen for the big and beastie that you plant during the summer. So there's a lot of concepts that we're going to cover in that series. But anyway, I'm going to jump you right to that now where I talk about how we establish this food plot. And uh, we'll give you a couple of close-ups here at the very end. We'll come back and we'll show you uh, what it looks like now after one week. Welcome to Food Plot Season here at FrigidForage.com. I'm standing down in the corner of one of my food plots here making a decision that I have to make every year when I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to plant in these spots. This is about a two acre plot. Uh, I've got a fella helping me out here that's tilling it now getting the seed bed ready. But you have basically two options at this time of the year. We're in early May. It's the spring planting season. I can either plant perennials or annuals. And with perennials you're mostly talking about the clover blends. And at Frigid Forge we're talking about the Pure Trophy Clover. And that's a blend of five clovers and it's ideally suited for a wide range of different conditions. Because it's a blend, uh, you're going to get some clovers that do well when it's dry and some that do uh, better when it's wet. You know, some are going to do a little bit better in the shady conditions and others will. That's why I like Pure Trophy Clover when I'm planting clover because you get enough variety that you can do well in almost any situation. Okay, so that's the perennial side. But the other, the other side of the question is, do I want to plant annuals instead? Now you're talking about um, more of a, a spring forage type of a plant. Soybeans, uh, possibly peas. Uh, there's other blends uh, that you can get that incorporate you know, different types of forage plants for planting in the spring. Also you can plant something like corn and that'll do really well for you during the uh, late, late season, winter, uh, when the deer are really seeking carbohydrates. So let's look at these uh, perennials and uh, uh, versus the annuals and kind of break this decision down. I like to have about 75% uh, annuals to 25% perennials on this farm. It just seems like you can feed an awful lot of deer uh, with these perennials because they can take the, the browsing grazing pressure and it doesn't wipe them out. Whereas if you get into your annuals, you know, there's only so much you can do. There's only so much pressure that corn and beans can take before the, the uh, the planting is worn out during the summer and you don't have anything there in the fall and the winter when you really need the food. I'm seeing a decent amount of the little small clovers uh, coming up out here. And this is going to be typical of what you're going to see after one week in probably average to better than average growing conditions. We've had quite a bit of rain but the temperatures have been cool. And really what you need is you need the you know warm soil temperatures and you need the moisture. Uh, so we've only had really half of that uh, formula you know, perfected this past week, but uh, there's, there's lots of them in here. I'm, I'm seeing you know, just within arm's reach probably 15 to 20 uh, little clover plants coming up, and it'll, it'll just turn into a green carpet over the next couple of weeks. I mean, they'll start popping up all over the place. The ones that are in the shallowest uh, with the amount of moisture we got are the ones that are gonna come up first. And then the ones that are, you know, eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch under the ground because they you know they got packed in a little bit tighter or whatever 
uh, they're going to be the ones that come up last. Uh, the thing that I'm going to have to do here in about probably a month, I'm guessing, is come in here and mow this thing and clean it up. There's going to be some broadleaf competition. I can see that already with some of the stuff that we didn't get killed when we tilled it up. So there'll be plants in here that I need to clean up. And it's easiest to do that just by mowing it. And that's something that's really standard when you're maintaining clover like this. Establish it in the spring, get it a good start, and then clean it up by mowing it. And then by the fall, you should have a decent uh, stand of clover that the deer will utilize the next year. It'll be really good. So if you enjoy the challenges of planting food plots as much as we do, uh, please go check out the food plot season at frigidforage.com. And now we're gonna do a little bit of mushroom hunting. Well, it's May 12th here in Southern Iowa. We went out to find Aaron a turkey this afternoon and it started raining, so we decided to go try and find some mushrooms. There was a spot that he knew about. We're on a west facing slope that leads down into this bottom and we're looking around all these half dead elm trees. And we found a few to begin with and we just found a pile of mushrooms. We probably got a hundred mushrooms in this 10 yard radius around this dead elm right in front of me. And we gotta be careful where we're stepping because we've actually stepped on a few. They're everywhere, they're down in the undergrowth. We just gotta get down on our hands and knees and look and we keep finding more that we didn't even see to begin with. So we're gonna pick all these mushrooms and have us a good meal tonight. Get out and find you some morel mushrooms. They're popping up everywhere and this is the time to pick them. Well, that's it for today's episode. I threw a lot at you, and hopefully we can keep plenty of content coming your way over the next few weeks of the Midwest Whitetail Off-Season Series. I appreciate you joining me. We'll see you right back here again next Monday for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail, and remember to always dream big.